Hey YouTube, Do It Yourself Junkie 369 and today is day 18 of our RV10 build and I'm still working on the rudder. I've got the pieces that I was going to deburred, deburred last time. So now it's time to move on to page four, step one. And that's putting one of the ribs together. And I deburred the ribs, but I didn't facet them yet. I'm going to wait until those are basically uh, assembled with Clecos before I st start worrying about faceting them. And I try to talk less during these videos, that way they're not so long as my last build videos, which are probably all over an hour. On this rudder horn, you're probably going to need a rat tail file to get into some of these corners.
So I'm marking these left and right so you don't accidentally countersink the wrong side. You want to countersink the side with the writing on them, obviously. Uh, just a note though, this is the left side of the rudder, this is the right. So when you're facing it, the left is over here on your right, not to get that too confused. And uh, as you start clicking stifters together, and the biggest thing it says is to make sure the left stiffener is on top of the right. And it looks like we're about to use a lot of eighth inch clicos because you're going to have to do this step to every single stiffener set. Basically you go through make them all look like this A through G and there'll be match drilling but I'm probably going to assemble them all first and then match drill at one time even though it says assemble match drill and then after that the instructions are repeat through all the stiffeners. And on those reinforcement plates I'm put, I just put in, I'm going to put an O, any, any type of mark would really do. That way I know, like if I put it on there where I can see the mark, I have it in the same orientation that I drilled it in. Now, the last step is to match drill all the holes.
Okay, so to make this easier to match drill these holes, I'm going to temporarily remove this stiffener back here so I can match drill the holes in the counterbalance rib. <laughs> from the back side of the spar and I can't do that I'd have to get the long drill bit out if I was going to do that with the uh, stiffener still installed Since it says to deburr the edges of the rotor skins, I am just going to peel the plastic off right now. I don't feel like I could get a good deburr on this with the plastic still on there. And I know these aren't a lot of work. But could you imagine having to create these skins from scratch? And cutting the, the uh, sheet would be one thing, but going in and finding the position of each one of these holes and drilling it. Building the first RV3s. As cool as it would to be out to own one of those, man, that would be a lot of work and a pretty high level of commitment. And on a completely separate note, I'm glad all that rudder's together because I uh, have four Clecos left, four eighth inch Clecos. So I'll make sure to note how many I used in the uh, bill blog. Because that's how much you're going to need to get through this step. And it's a lot. I think I have, uh, I think I have close to 100 of those. I'm, I might have 75.
Okay, it says to deburr both skins and then attach the right skin. I'm going to set one of these aside for right now and go ahead and click this one in place. Uh, that way I can, can move the rotor assembly around, it'll be a lot stiffer. Because right now it's on my workbench and I would like to get it out of there and make it a lot easier to burr that second skin. Although, so, it'd just be a lot stiffer with this piece on it and I feel a lot safer like sticking it somewhere while I work on the second skin. I just <laughs> sent a uh, picture of a high wing aircraft to a friend and uh, he writes back, the uh, wing is on the wrong side of the aircraft. I, went, I know. And he writes back, darn communist. And hopefully he watches this because uh, he watches some of my videos. I think he'll get a kick out of me sharing that with everybody. Pretty funny. I hope a communist is offended by that statement. Uh, for you guys that like high wing aircrafts, don't take it too personal. Um, if it helps, just know that at the time of filming this, and probably maybe even a year or two in advance, I have not flown in any GA aircraft that isn't a high wing. All Cessnas 172, 177, and 182. That's all I've flown so far. bottom rib and the bottom stiffener are close enough together. You need the clicos of the stiffener on top and the clicos of the rib on the bottom. So I've got to switch these around. <clears throat> Otherwise the clicos will touch the two and force them out of their proper alignment to where you can't clico the skin to them. which I thought might be an issue, but I wasn't sure until I hit this point. A little bit flexible still, because it only has one skin on, but a lot better than it could be if I was trying to move it all by itself. So we'll just set it out of the way and finish deburring that other skin.
So there's two of these, same length. So just pick one of the trailing edges and use it. The other one, I had to guess, is going to be used on, I want to say the elevator, but it doesn't seem long enough. And so it's about five feet long, which means that about all it's going to be able to handle is the rudder. There won't be really anything extra out of this piece. And I know the elevators are much, much wider than that. They're a bit over 10 feet, which just think about the long spar you have in there. So I'm thinking uh, elevator trim. That's the only explanation for a piece that short on the trailing edge. I don't think it would have given you a extra one just in case you messed up. Need the click of this thing in place and then trim off the extra. And it says to either sand or file. Um, not quite sure why they don't want you cutting it. Uh, I might try to trim a little bit on cutting and then file. Uh, hopefully I don't mess, hopefully that doesn't cause me to mess something up. But first thing I need to click on it in place. And it's going to end up overhanging longer on one side than the other. You try to overhang longer on the bottom. The uh, top won't be uh, um, overhanging all the way. Part of it will be um, on the skin and not overhanging at all. But if you go overhang long on that end, this end has just enough overhang on it so that is obviously the correct way to do this. And why not? drilling this or anything so you just need to sort of hold it in place so I'm click going about every five holes and in case you're wondering this is the piece that gets the pro seal on it that's not until much later
So this morning I spent about an hour going through the plans for the epinage, trying to figure out where I need to use Pro Seal at, and then I marked those with these flags. And there's three different spots that looks like I use it. One's for the rudder trailing edge, the elevator trailing edge, and then there's a couple of foam rib locks that are made out of this foam and they get glued in using that Pro Seal. And basically, I'm going to do the steps up to that point on each item. And then I bought Pro, the 3.5 ounce uh, syringe of Pro Seal and I will try to do all these at one time. Now, I bought it off of Vans and they say it has the same two hour working time as the one quart container. But I'm a little bit worried because the part number ends in B1 slash 2, or 1 half, which means that it should have a 30 minute working time, versus the quart container which ends in B2, meaning 2 hours working time. But on the website they also said that it has the same 2 hour working time as the quart container. So we'll see when I get it. Um, worst case scenario, I can mix it and I can throw it in a freezer and that will extend the working time. Um, if your freezer gets down to negative 40 degrees, which I don't think anybody has one of those, it could, the two hour stuff could last up to 30 days in that freezer mixed together. Uh, my freezer only goes to about negative three if I remember correctly. And with the half hour stuff, I'm thinking that might be able to draw it out to an hour or two maybe, working time. The other plan is I could attack the uh, gluing the foam blocks and the elevator trailing edges first because that should be relatively short working time. I just got to put stuff together and clico it and clamp it versus this where I have to clico a little bit, get in there, rivet, clico a little bit, get in there and rivet. So that's going to take the most time and I think I could do that in half an hour. But I can't do that and then go to that. And I don't think I could do it in that order and finish it in a half an hour. Um, I'll probably do a dry run beforehand and time it to see how, how it goes. The other option is I could ask for help, get somebody in here and while they're gluing that together, I could be riveting this together. And that way both projects have half an hour because we're using the same pot of Pro Seal, and now it's uh, like Flame Master or something. They switched, which is great because Pro Seal has gotten really expensive for some reason. It meets the same mill standard, so don't worry about that. It's basically the same stuff, just different brand name, different price tag. Um, so that that would be an option of doing both those at the same time. Uh, worst worst case scenario. I mix it, I work on something, get it done, and go back and find that the rest of the Pro Seal has already passed its working, uh, its work time, and then I won't be able to use it and I'll have to buy some more. And that's part of the reason, so it, it's a risk, but at the same time, the price of the 1 ounce and the 3.5 ounce are almost the same. I think there's a dollar difference. So... If I get the three and a half ounce and it works, I just saved about $17 versus getting two containers of the one ounce and then spending twice as much. Now, if the three and a half ounce fails, well, then I spend the extra $17 and I come out even either way. Uh, both those options are worse than the quart. If you uh, figure out that price tag and extrapolate out for a quart's worth in those small three and a half ounce containers. The quart would cost about $134, but luckily it's not that expensive. Uh, I don't remember the price. I, I think it's like $42 or something, which is way better. Uh, the only deal is if you buy the quart now, you, you mix up what you need. So that's the good part. But the shelf life might only be four hours or not. Not four hours, four day, four months. I'll get the right time in there somewhere. If you 
the, the portion that you don't use, the shelf life would be four months. It might be a little bit longer depending on what batch you get and what date is stamped on it. But the website specifically says you'll have at least four months from when you purchase it. And that's just kind of a, it's been sitting on their shelf for a while. And at a minimum they can kind of guarantee that you'll get that. Anything older than that they probably throw away or use. So that's the Pro Seal. Um, we'll see what happens when we get there. So basic, basically I'm going to get to a certain point where this uh, rudder is ready to go together and I'll have to stop. And then at that point I'll move on to the, I could do the horizontal stabilizer at that point, but it might be worth moving on to the elevators specifically, which I think are their own section, so I might skip a section. And that way I can get to the Pro Seal stuff earlier because I, I just bought that Pro Seal this morning or the uh, Flame Master and when it gets here it might only have four months shelf life which I should be able to get this done. I'm, I'm planning on having the whole Epinage done in under three months so I should be able to get to it before then but I'm, I might move stuff around to make sure I get to it as soon as possible. So just be aware of that and I'll try to uh, color code the sections of airplane correctly. I had pre-done them. I had uh, highlighted ahead of time before I started building on the order stuff should have been built and finished. <coughs> so I might have to go back and adjust my drawings a little bit to make all make that work out. So back to uh, match drilling this and moving ahead. So the last part of this step is to drill the trailing edge and you have to, everywhere else you're drilling perpendicular to the skin but not down here. You have to drill perpendicular to the cord line. So that means from this middle hole up here down to here is a line that's considered the cord line and you want to drill perpendicular to that. So not perpendicular to the skin on either side but straight across and you can do you can wrap a quarter or a piece of string around this drag it to here and then set the uh, rudder up 
So that line is parallel to the floor for the bench, and that will help. So you, you would uh, just put that string there, maybe uh, put a level next to it so you can see, or something, some sort of straight edge, and then block up the back edge of it and make sure that you keep that edge parallel. And that should help you get perpendicular because at that point it'll be setting something like this. And then you know just to drill straight down and ignore the surface of the skin. You might notice I'm using a lot of Clicos on this trailing edge. Uh, you're supposed to start in the middle of the rudder and travel outward and actually Clico every hole. So during this step, even if you go down to minimal Clicos on the rest of the skin, you're, you're going to need about 200, or not 200, yeah, 200 Clicos to do this probably. Next step is you uh, need to remove the skins and label it left and right. I'm going to label it while it's still on here before I remove it. And I'm putting it on the outside and I'll just wipe it off later with acetone, especially before it gets painted. That way it doesn't bleed through. But the key thing is I'm putting left outside. That way I make sure to dimple the right side of the skin, or the, the correct side of the skin. The other reason I didn't mark the inside is because I'm going to prime the inside, and when I clean it before priming, that's going to wipe off the marking. And if I leave it on the outside, I don't really need to wipe it off until after it's uh, assembled or I could leave it as long as right up until I paint the aircraft. Next step is to put a slight bend, so you have the sheet of metal and a quarter inch in, you'll put a slight bend down, that way when you rivet this edge down, it pushes down on it and it comes out perfectly flat. If you don't put that bend in there and it's laying flat when you rivet it, it'll curl the edge up and you don't want that. So you can do it using the edge of your bench and some wood, like you could put a, a, a saw kerf in a piece of wood and put it on there and, and bend it down just slightly and just go real slow with it, maybe do it in a couple passes. Uh, they make a pair of pliers that does the same thing. Or they make roller tools like this. I've seen vice grip versions, versions that look like this. There's all different kinds of stuff out there. Um, I'm only using this because an EAA member and uh, guy that I've been hanging out with 
going to, uh, yesterday I helped him uh, move one of his wings to attach to his aircraft. He wasn't using this, gave it to me to try out. So I'm going to try it. And basically you just put the skin between the rollers and then it bends in this orientation a slight lip up. So this way it would bend down. And you want the outside of your skin the bend to go away from that. You want it to go to the inside of the skin. So either I have to hold it in this orientation, which uh, might be the way to go, or I need to flip the skin over so that the I can hold it in this orientation and the skin will be facing with the inside up. I'll try to get in here where you can see it. So just that much of a bend, like barely, probably 30 degrees off of flat. So that way, when you rivet this down, this should squish out flat instead of curling up. And that is covered in section 5, which lately I've been linking that to almost every video I've made. Um, it's in 5K. And in that section they cover how to do the uh, wood method. And that didn't turn out as bad as I was thinking. There, there is a risk of bending it too much with the uh, pliers. And if you do that, when you rivet it down, it, it will have a little bit of a bump to it instead of sitting flush like it should be. And I was worried about that happening. Give this a shot of WD-40. It doesn't seem to roll as well as it should. There we go. That's much better. Okay, now these rollers spin freely, or before they were sticking a little bit. I bet this one is a lot easier than the last. Much better. Next step is it has you remove these reinforcing plates and mark what side is facing out. Um, if you didn't skip it in the video earlier, I had already put an O on there. And sometimes this is just common sense. You put it together, Clico, you know it's going to have to come apart and get deburred, so you might as well mark which face is facing out so you don't accidentally flip it around. Um, I guess really the, I marked the outside. The instruction says to mark which side goes against the uh, spar. Either way I think it's going to work for you. They just seem to be trying to put marks where you won't see them when it's assembled. Which, I guess if you're not painting it, that would kind of be a big deal. Uh, part of me wonders, why does it matter if it's inside the skin? You won't be able to see it anyway. And now it's... Uh, Disassemble everything and deburr everything that hasn't been deburred. Uh, whole, I, I went ahead and I had all the edges deburred before I started this. So really I just have to make sure to deburr all the holes.
I did not end up fluting these when I put the skin before I put the skin on there. Um, I might go back and do a little bit of light fluting, although this line is straight enough that it doesn't seem to matter like it does with the nose rims. And even though you didn't drill anything here on this large center hole, it was punched and probably has a burr, so you want to knock that off. Don't forget to hit that one up. After I uh, had finished all the work on these, I had decided that these sharp square corners here should be rounded off.
Okay, so it's time to dimple the skins. Big thing on here is make sure you dimple the right side, which is why I marked the outside, so I know I need to dimple this side. And then also, uh, don't dimple any holes that don't correspond to the frame. So this first row of holes down here, Actually, I didn't, uh, I've got to take this setup down. I never uh, deburred the holes in the skin. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I spent all that time deburring the frame and I got so excited that I was done that I forgot I hadn't deburred the skin. So, but. When you do get to the dimpling, make sure you dimple the right side. And then also, don't dimple these holes down here that do not correspond to the frame. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten holes down there. Um, don't dimple the front holes up here. And then these holes along the top, which I need to drop the skin down so you can see it. These holes along the very top edge, same as the bottom edge, don't correspond to any frame piece, so don't dimple them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine of those. So right along the edge here on the top, right along the edge on the bottom, and this very front edge here which gets curled around later and dimp, uh, riveted to the other skin, so you don't want to dimple that either. Everything else gets dimpled. Um, so now back to uh, deburring since I forgot to do these. And then um, later you'll see me set up the dimple C frame here and just go to town and probably won't talk about anything at that point because I've already covered it. This is where having that table or this workbench just a little bit higher would help me out.
Okay, so one thing I'll say about this, after dumpling all that, my hands are pretty sore. Um, so I've got four stiffeners to go. I'm going to take a slight break from that and start painting some of this, uh, priming it. That way I can give my hands a rest and have some parts drying while I finish these up. That way I can go into riveting stuff together tonight. So I'm on page 6, section 7, page 6, step 12, which says to machine countersink, machine countersink this trailing edge. And on this, we drilled perpendicular to the cord line, but now that we're countersinking it, we're going to countersink perpendicular to the surface. So just be aware of that. Normally don't clean up or deburr countersinks, but these are so thin on the edge that they were uh, kind of horrible looking, so I had to go in there and touch them up with that <coughs> deburring tool. And now all that's left is to paint all the parts that I haven't painted yet. Or sorry, I keep saying paint, prime, I'm priming the parts. I had these pieces over on the other bench. I need to prime them as well.
I still have a little bit of uh, priming left to do, but while I'm waiting on those parts to dry so I can flip them over and paint the other side, I can go ahead and start working on riveting stuff together. probably put a note in the uh, rivet how to rivet video but just in case you miss it there I have this gun turned all the way down to 50 right now um, it, on the instructions it says 70 to 90 that is way too high I'm driving uh, dash 4 rivets right now with it set on uh, And I'm guessing I could go lower even for dash 3, but this seems to be pretty good. Maybe a little bit low for a dash 4. Well, that's horrible. So... One is K1000-06, which is the wrong one, and the other is K1000-6, which is the right one. And as I said earlier, if you try to click on the wrong one in place, it won't fit, luckily, which is... <laughs> I'm sitting there going like, okay, what gives? How come I can't get this to fit? And it's because ones I didn't realize one they were both so close. It's just that one is a zero six and the other is just six. That's a really mean thing to do. And this is kind of a tight area to get into, so I'm definitely going to use the squeezer on it instead of the rivet gun. Okay, so 
I'm going to say dash 4 needs to be a little bit higher than 50 PSI. Maybe 60 is good. So probably dash 3, 50, 60, dash 4. Um, of course, that's my personal preference. You might want it a bit lower if you're kind of uh, not used to using the rivet gun. I'm just looking at it as I like to have it set in about three trigger pulls, and this is taking four to five. But my trigger pulls might be shorter than what you use. So it all comes down to what you feel comfortable with and what you like. That's going to wrap up this video. Uh, it's really late and I'm having trouble even thinking. I could keep going, but I'm afraid I'll make a mistake. Uh, please hit the thumbs up if you like the video. Subscribe if you want to get notified when I upload a new one. And uh, if you want like an email notification, of course, hit the bell icon. And thanks for watching. Other than that, down in the description I have my builder log. If you want to download that, that's more up to date and real time. I go in every night and load in what I did that day. And you can use it yourself. I've built in a couple things like I have a estimator that guesses when my finish date is based on how many days since I've started and average number of hours per day and it, it calculates out what that based on that info so right now there's l very little data so each data point causes wild variations in the finish date um, that if I skip a day it, it counts it as almost adding a year to my build um, so today's hours will actually drop it down quite a bit to uh, my true expected two year finish date. And then if you've enjoyed the videos and you're thinking about building your own aircraft, I suggest going with Vans. They have some of the uh, best aircraft out there. They're a little bit on the expensive side, but they're well worth the price. And hopefully someday I'll get around to making the videos on how I came to the decision to build the RV-10. Um, but if my builder's number is below in the description as well, so if you're looking at getting a Vans aircraft, uh, please give them my builder's number and they'll thank me by sending a hundred bucks. It doesn't tack on anything extra to your bill. It's just a finder's fee that Vans hands out when uh, people order kits because they've um, seen somebody else building or gone up and flew with somebody that has a Vans aircraft and they enjoyed it and decided to get their own. And as I said before, thanks for watching. I enjoyed doing the videos. Um, today was a really long day. Hopefully it doesn't make the video too long for you guys to watch. But I, I tried to keep talking to a minimum so you would get to watch it in fast forward speed for a lot of it. Um, as far as steps, I am pretty much done with page six, except for I have one skin still that I have to prime. Uh, the other parts all been primed. And I've just finished up step two on page seven, which was basically the last step in putting this Brack or this uh, rib, bottom rib together with the rudder horn on it, and uh, my first uh, nut plate, which was pretty 
interesting. I had to use a Clico clamp to hold the plate on there because when I removed one of the um, Clicos, the end would pull up, and so I, I was I couldn't rivet. I actually had to drill out a rivet. Like when I tried to squeeze it, it didn't go so well, and I was having a hard time like keeping the plate against the metal and hold the bucking bar in there and stuff. So. Uh, I put a Clico clamp on it, which helped. As soon as I started riveting, the Clico clamp snapped off of the nut plate, but it held just long enough for me to buck the rivet enough to hold it firm in place. And then I was able to continue uh, bucking the rivet until the shop head was the correct size. So I guess. Normally you can screw a, a screw or a nut or something into them to hold them. Not, well, not a nut, but a, a screw or a bolt to hold them tight. But I could not, going through the hardware, I th I'm thinking the um, uh, rod bearing end screws into them, but I wasn't sure and I didn't want to mess up anything. So I just went the route of using a, a Clico clamp and luckily, I have the inch long ones, otherwise if I had the half inch ones, I don't think it would have worked out so great. Um, that's all I've got to, for today. Um, hopefully I'll be back out here tomorrow, although I need to uh, do some work on my, well I've got a project car I need to work on, and I've got a broken car, the timing chain snapped on it that I need to work on. So. And I have to mow my yard at some point. We're headed into spring, so I have to mow at least once a week, sometimes twice a week. So hopefully I'll get some time in on this tomorrow. Um, if not, weather's supposed to be horrible Sunday, so I guess I'll get a lot of work in on that day. And that will be the start of the next video. So again, thanks for watching, and check out all that stuff I talked about down in the description. And please hit the thumbs up button.